Well, now that our head is spinning from the work of Talcott Parsons, we're going to bring it back down and ground it a little bit in the work of Robert K. Merton. Now, Merton was a student of Parsons, and so uh, still from the functionalist school, but he parts ways with Parsons quite a bit in his work, and he does exactly what we would hope a good sociology theorist would do in that he makes some contributions to the field which push the boundaries of what we know with regard to theory. And that's exactly what we want a good social theory to do. We don't want theories to repeat themselves over time, not adding any new information to the body of knowledge. What we really want our theories to do is to push the boundary ever so slightly and allow us to sit back and think about those new developments. Do they make sense? Can we apply them? And so this is really where Merton uh, shines, the idea of application of theory. Parsons couldn't really do that. His theories, his uh, overarching body of work throughout his career is what we consider to be grand theories. Grand theories try to explain every aspect of society from this superstructural level. And what we find then is if we try to test the work of Parsons, we really can't do that. It's just simply too vague. So Merton comes up with this notion of middle range theories. We really need to understand that middle range theories add, with regard to sociology, the ability to whittle away at that really big abstract picture of society that doesn't allow us to do any kind of concrete research. It brings our focus down to a more manageable level and it allows us to make some educated guesses, some hypotheses, which can be tested. All right, so let's talk about the components of middle range theory. Unlike grand theory, which gives us these vague sorts of notions about what it is that makes society work, middle range theories actually bring the focus down. They allow us to look at a limited set of assumptions about society and only a few or maybe even just one selected hypothesis which can be tested via a research project. And so when we do that research, what we end up with are limited ranges of data which are easy for us to interpret and apply to how society exists. You'll recall when we were talking about Parsons that a lot of the information I discussed was a little fuzzy, a little vague. Okay, I get the gist, but how do we actually know that that is working? And that is one of the major criticisms of the work of Parsons. But when Merton enters the picture, he tries to address some of those problems that Parsons had by applying these notions of middle range theory. And what this actually does for us is it allows us to fill in the sociological blanks with regard to, is this working? It gives us a small enough data set to be able to test and then make some statements about whether or not there's some validity to the idea, to the concept, to the theory. And again here, with the notion of dysfunctions, Merton parts ways with Parsons. Merton emphasizes the role of dysfunctions in society. Parsons was always looking for how something is functioning. But Merton again pushes the theoretical envelope, so to speak, and he talks about how the notion of dysfunctions has to be a part of the picture. And he says two major things about dysfunction. He says, Things can be dysfunctional in society. Not everything works optimally all the time. We can have things that actually exist in a dysfunctional state. 
Some would say that we have many aspects of contemporary American society which are existing in a dysfunctional state, which leads us to his point number two. The notion of dysfunction is a value term. It really depends on who we're talking to as to whether or not we see something as functioning or dysfunctioning. And a prime example of that would be our economy. If you talk to wealthy people, politicians, you hear a lot of rhetorical statements about how our economy is working exactly the way it's supposed to work. If you talk to somebody who's been on unemployment for two years and can't find a job because the businesses are shutting down, they're going to tell you that our economy is dysfunctional. So this is really an important part that Parsons didn't consider with regard to how society works. Dysfunction is in the eye of the beholder. Finally, Merton also concentrates and expands the vocabulary of what functions are. And he comes up with these two concepts of manifest and latent functions. Manifest functions are the intended consequences of something in society. It's what that particular institution was intended to do. The latent functions of that particular thing, whatever it is, that social institution, that value, that ideal, are the unintended consequences of how it plays out for society. So let's see if we can get a concrete example of manifest and latent functions. So, you know, all functions are social factors that affect us in our society. And Merton, with regard to manifest and latent functions, would say that when we're looking at any social event, we need to be asking the question, for whom is this functional? And by doing this, we can probably then tease out what's the manifest function and what's the latent function here. All right, so let's see if we can pinpoint exactly what he meant. Let's think about um, our economy again, since that seems to be one of the eminent social problems that we have in our society today. What are the intended consequences of outsourcing all of those jobs? Well, the main goal is to improve a company's profit margin. And by outsourcing jobs, we can provide cheaper goods to consumers. And when we can provide cheaper goods and keep our labor costs down, we maximize profits for a company. But the latent functions of that causes problems, unintended consequences for people who lose their jobs who may lose their home because they don't have a job, and who have to rely on our systems for unemployment compensation. So Merton said it doesn't serve us to really just look for the manifest functions, the positive attributes of how that particular entity is working well. We need to look farther, he would say. We need to look at how this thing may not be working well the latent consequences. Latent functions don't necessarily have to be bad for society either. Uh, for example, the manifest function of dating in a given society is mate selection. I want to shop around a little bit before I decide to get married. One of the latent consequences of dating, sexual exploration. Um, when we reach that mature age where we can make that decision, uh, oftentimes we decide rather than waiting to get married to have some sort of sexual relationship, we do that while we're dating. And so while the manifest function of dating for a society is for us to settle down, find a mate, and procreate to have a family, the unintended consequences of dating are hmm, having a good time. You get the point. Now, the work of Merton goes much deeper than this. This really just scratches the surface of a couple of his contributions, the idea of middle range theories and his contributions to system dysfunctions. You can clearly see how he has built on the work of Talcott Parsons. We'll talk again soon. Take care.